So it's 11 o'clock and I don't know what's going on here. Um, <laughs> I fell asleep a little after one um, and I just slept for 10 hours straight um, on top of all of the extra sleeping I've been doing the last few days. Like I I never sleep for 10 hours straight. The only, the only time I would ever sleep for 10 hours straight is if I was coming home from a concert um, and I was just like smashed. That's like the only time like if, if I was really drunk. Um, so this is um, odd, I don't know. Um, I think I'm up. Uh, so it's 11 o'clock on Thursday, and I, I don't know. Um, I, I thought I was gonna, I, I, I thought I was over that, but I mean like at 10 hours, if I sleep again, like if I have another short day, I don't know, maybe I should go to a doctor, because like, or, may, or maybe my ass just got really badly kicked with that compost run, and I should take it as a lesson to uh, calm down a little. Uh, you know, don't don't exert yourself so hard. You're getting old, Jessica. Um, chill a little. Um, then again, it's no doubt not a coincidence that um, that's right after not smoking. I don't want to sleep for 15 hours a day. If that's what not smoking means, I don't know. Maybe I need to reconsider this. Um, maybe I'll pick up cocaine. I I, I don't know. Um, I'm only half joking. I, I, I don't like sleeping. Um, but, um, I'm gonna take this as, like, getting over a hump. Um, my throat feels a little bit less croaky. That's a, that's a positive. Um, and, uh, see, I, I don't think I'm over the withdrawals yet, that's the thing. But, um, we'll see. Um, right now I think I'm up. Uh, I'm gonna get some archiving before I eat. Um, and, like, I, I kind of want to take a shower, but I kind of don't. Um, I want I want the shower to be like like symbolic, like I'm done archiving, I'm done smoking, I'm moving forward. So I'm probably gonna put it off for a few days, um, and uh, such as such as the reality of it. I don't think I'm doing anything until I, I basically get everything off the computer, um, or sorry, off the internet. And like um, yesterday, I spent most of the day. Um, well, I spent the whole day. Um, cleaning up um, what was left of my main Facebook profile. I'm going to reduce it to a very loose CV. I'm removing it from search engines. I'm removing comments, abilities. It's like a read-only CV that you can't get to unless I give you the link. Um, just because I want that to exist in case I do want to give someone the link. Um, and I'm going to create a new Facebook profile for the Ultra Reality. Um, I'm going to create a new Bandcamp site for the Ultra Reality. All of these kinds of things. So it's going to be like two separate existences, and they're not going to mix. That's the way that I want to do this. Um, it's not going to be so so hard to find it, obviously. But um, like for example, the blog, the vlog will be connected to it. Um, in fact, this will be the talking in the vlog will be the only way to put the pieces together. And um, yeah, so <laughs> that's the truth of it. Um, and uh, I'm going to get back to it now. So this is still after five, or very close to it anyways, and I'm stopping to eat. Um, you know, and I was thinking, instead of throwing out a sticker, you know, every day or every other day, or sometimes two in a day, I went through and I got all my banana stickers and all my tomato stickers, and I'm throwing them all out at once. This is about a month's worth. Um, and you know what? The actual blunt reality is that if I throw all the stickers out at once, I may not throw anything at all in the garbage for days at a time. Um, we'll see how that works out, but um, it's probably all the tomatoes for the month and all the bananas until about the 20th anyway, so most of the month. Um, and you can put that in context and see just how much or how little garbage that actually is, right? So, um, yeah. So my video today is I'm on the cult of Mithra, and um, I, I'm informed, I should say, I, I, I need to specify that I'm speaking of Mithras rather than Mithra, because it is a Western concept rather than an Eastern concept, and there are large differences, and nobody can make sense of it. Um, this is an issue that I think actually um, shows up. Um, in, in multiple places, um, in um, uh, 
classical research um, over a very long period of time in a wide variety of contexts. And the basic problem is that researchers see things in Greece, Rome, or that general, you know, in, in Europe, and they say, gee, that looks kind of, kind of Iranian or kind of Indian. So it looks like it probably came from Iran, but it doesn't really quite look like Iran. And it, why is it why is it similar but different? We we you know and and this kind of issue in trying to make sense of it. Nobody ever seems to want to point out that um, there were a lot of Iranians living to the north of the Black Sea. You didn't have to be in the Iranian plateau or in the Indian subcontinent or even um, up in Central Asia or in the Caspian to be an Iranian. You could have been parked right where the Ukraine is today and even quite further to the west of that. Um, we know there were lots of Iranians in Europe um, in the ancient world. It wasn't just Germans and Celts. In fact, there weren't really countries there. What there were were tribes, and the tribes moved around all over the place. And they interbred with each other, but you know they kept identities. They merged with each other. They split off from each other. Um, and, and there wouldn't have really been this kind of concept of a country. Um, to have a country, you need an army, and they didn't really have that. So we know there were Iranians in France um, for the entirety of antiquity. Um, we know that Iranians were a part of the, um, the barbarian invasions that ended the German Empire. Um, we know that they moved with the Huns. We know that they moved with the Mongols. They were um, quite populous, um, like I say, in the area spreading from Belgium, France, Germany, Poland, Ukraine. There were Iranians all over the place. So there's not really any reason why you have to say that this Iranian-looking thing has to um, come directly from uh, a Zoroastrian tradition. It could very well have come from an Alanian tradition. The Alans being the most... A notable um, tribe of Iranians in Europe. Um, and in fact, if you look through the areas of France and Belgium and Germany, you can see all kinds of toponyms that are very clearly Iranian, indicating that they weren't just floating through, but they were building settlements. Um, this is an issue that comes up um, fairly frequently as well, um, you know, in, in relation to finding, you know, ideas like reincarnation in Greek literature. And they say, well, did Plato have something to do with Buddha? Did, did, was there contact there? Um, you know, did the early Christians uh, have contact with Indian? It's not necessary. We know that there were large-scale migrations of Thracian peoples into Greece, and we know that they probably brought a lot of Iranian religion in, in there. <clears throat> and, and thus what we call Eastern religion actually has an indigenous European source in the area around the Ukraine. The problem is that people don't... It's just not... In order to understand that, you have to have a broader concept of history. And it's just never been what people looked for. So, you know, you, you want to, like, you know, the story of Mithras is that, you know, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, around the time that, you know, the Roman Empire started falling into barbarian um, control, um, all of these Iranian religious cults showed up. Um, and it just happens to be that it's the same time that all of these Iranians started moving into Europe. It's really not that much of a mystery, is it? If you really sit down and look at it and think about it carefully. No, is it? Um, what's missing there is some 
hard evidence, and thus I say to you archaeologists, go out and prove the obvious. Um, and, you know, be a little bit more... Pay, pay a little bit more attention to detail next time, because I, you shouldn't really need me sitting here and browbeating you about this. You should have seen that yourself, and you should have seen how obvious it was. And it should already be, you know, like, the research should be done, it should be in your museums, it should be in your textbooks, it should be dealt with. This shouldn't be this mysterious thing. Okay, it's, it's as clear as day, and it's as obvious, you just missed it. You missed the obvious. And now that I'm pointing it out, you should go fix it, and it just, you know, go bake your crow and, and deal with it and just get on with it kind of thing, right? <clears throat> Another thing I want to point out, though, um, and of course, I mean, this This again makes perfect sense. Um, the cult of Mithras um, was a cult that was uh, mostly uh, followed by people in the military, um, which would have been mercenaries um, of largely non-Roman origin, although certainly not of, not of Persian origin. But the Persians were the bad guys. Would have been of German, Celtic, and of course Alanian origin. You have to think at some point. Um, the Roman power structure is going to look at the situation and say, whoa, our military is being taken over by a Persian belief system. And so it's not hard to see why um, it was that um, the ideas were forcefully um, subsumed under the uh, Christian um, construction, and you know things were worked in, uh, ideas were merged together, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, right? But um, it, it shouldn't be a mystery because the reality is that there were millions of Iranians in Europe at the time. <laughs>